So hi everybody. This is basically where we got uh, last time. Let's recap uh, quickly what what we have seen in the last twenty minutes of the of the last lesson, and then we move forward from that point. So last time we started talking about trajectory optimization, uh, discussing first why we need it. And the main reason why we need it is because reactive control, which is uh, task based inverse dynamics, for instance, is limited. It doesn't have uh, any idea about what's going to happen in, in the future. It has no notion of future state and future control. It can only reason about what happens right now in terms of control inputs and state uh, rate of change, so accelerations for uh, multiple <coughs> systems. So we need trajectory optimization because it allows us to, to yeah. take into account <coughs> potential problems that may happen into the future and to take the, the right decision right now so that we avoid uh, bumping into problems into the in the future. But we, then we discussed the, that the, the problem of trajectory optimization for locomotion and also for manipulation they are very hard problems because they involve uh, rigid contacts. And when we, when we have to model rigid contacts, we have typically two options. Either we model them as infinitely rigid, and in this case, they act as uh, constraints because once I'm in contact with something, I cannot move anymore in, in the direction where I made the contact. Uh, so this makes the, pro the, the dynamical system hybrid because every time I make a contact I have some constraints so my dynamics changes, okay? And trajectory optimization for hybrid dynamical system is very hard because it's a non-smooth optimization problem. So it's not ideal if you want to do it fast. Some people do it but that's not how we're going to do it. The other option is to model contacts with uh, like penalty methods, so spring dumpers, for instance. The problem is that the contacts we are interested in, they are not soft contacts, they are quite uh, stiff contacts. So we need to use very high stiffness values if we use penalty methods, which make the differential equation of the system stiff, so very difficult to integrate. So we need to, to rely on very small time steps for the numerical integration, which makes the optimization problem uh, very slow to solve. It's not an optimization problem, it's an optimal control problem because you have an integrator inside. <coughs> so neither of these two standard approaches work well for our, for our purpose. So the, the path we decided to take, which is the most uh, common is to model contacts as rigid but to predefine by hand the, the, the most difficult part of the problem which are the contacts. So we decide already uh, on with uh, which foot or hand uh, we are going to make contact and at which time we switch from one contact phase to the next one. Okay, And once you predefine that then the, your dynamical system is no longer hybrid, it's just time varying, okay? Because, okay, you have a dynamics that is changing, but it changes depending on a pattern that is already prefixed. So you have a time varying system, which is not hybrid, so the, the trajectory optimization problem is standard, so simple. Then we did one additional step in our reasoning, which is, okay, we have a, a, a traditional optimal control problem now, thanks to this uh, fixing of the, of the contact sequence, but it's still high dimensional, because a like robot has a large number of degrees of freedom. You have 18 for a quadruped, and you have more than 30 for a humanoid. So it would still be a, a big optimization problem to solve. So if we want to really make it fast, we need to rely on a, on a simplified model of the system, which is low dimensional. And for locomotion, we are really lucky because we have this very simple uh, simplified model that captures very well the, the dominant dynamic of the system. That is not the case for manipulation. So if you want to do manipulation, as far as I know, they have no 
nice simplified model as we do in locomotion, so they have a harder time to solve trajectory optimization problems. So the reduced model we're gonna use is the linear inverted pendulum. So it's an inverted pendulum, basically with a prismatic joint that as it falls, the, the height of the tip of the stick remains constant, okay? So as it falls, it becomes longer and longer so that the height is constant. But instead of uh, deriving it from the dynamics of a linear inverted pendulum, we are going to derive it, well, we already did derive it from the newton euler equation of uh, a single rigid body system. Why? Well, because I think it is easier to justify approximating a, a robot with a single rigid body that, than with a linear inverted pendulum. At least it is in my, in my mind. And actually, I mean, these equations, they are not an approximation, they are just what is called a, a reduced model of the system, meaning that the center of mass of the robot really satisfies the, the Newton equation, and the angular momentum of the robot really satisfies the other equation. So these equations, they are not an approximation, they are correct, but they are reduced because here you're just representing center of mass and angular momentum, so you're, you're not representing the motion of each degree of freedom of the system, but they're not simplified, they are reduced. Okay, so I think that this is a better starting point for the dynamic of our system that, than saying, okay, my robot is an inverted pendulum. It's not really an inverted pendulum, but it, it is a, a rigid body system, so it satisfies Newton euler equations. So we started from Newton euler equation, and then we, we showed that by taking uh, some simplifying assumptions, which are the following, We assume that all the contacts are with a flat ground, so that the height of the contact point is the same for all the contact points. And since it's the same for all the contact points, we can assume it is zero. We just set the reference frame on the ground, so that the, the z height of the ground is zero. We assume to have a constant angular momentum, so the derivative of the angular momentum is zero. This is actually not needed to get a linear model, but it's typically taken anyway because it, it reduces the number of variables we have to deal with. And also because in practice, it's a reasonable approximation for walking on a, on a flat ground. And the third assumption is that the, the height of the center of mass of the robot is gonna remain constant. So, the, the second acceleration of the center of mass in the z direction is going to be zero. And I, I've shown at the whiteboard that by taking these uh, three assumptions, we can derive from the Newton Euler equation the following uh, dynamics, which says that basically the difference between the center of mass position and a constant times the center of mass acceleration is equal to this quantity over here, which is the center of pressure. Okay, because it's basically a weighted average of the contact point where the weights are the normal forces applied at each point. Okay. And then we observed that since we have unilater unilateral contacts, so contacts on which we can only push, not pull. Of course, that's again an assumption. If, if I have, if I grasp a bar on the bar, I can push and I can pull. But for locomotion, typically you have unilateral contacts, so you only push on the environment, you never pull. So if we have only unilateral contact, which is a typical case, then the the force in the normal direction, which is z, if the contacts are with a flat ground, they can only be positive, not negative. So if these quantities are all non-negative, and these are also the weights that are used here in this weighted average of the contact points, it means that the center of pressure, which is this quantity here, 
which I will call Z from now on, is going to remain inside the convex hull of the contact points. Because it's a weighted average of points with positive weight. So it can only stay inside the convex hull of these points. Okay, this is just geometric reasoning. And it also makes a lot of sense from a physical viewpoint because the center of pressure cannot, can never leave the, the surface of contact, right? You cannot have a center of pressure that's outside the contact surface. And this relationship holds in both directions. So see, if the normal forces are positive, then this quantity is going to be inside the convex hull of the contact point. And also the, the other way around works. If this quantity is inside the convex hull of the contact point, then it means that there exist positive normal forces that gives me this value of the center of pressure. Why is that important? It's important because from now on, in this reduced model, we will forget about the, the, the contact forces applied at each contact point, and we will only work with the center of pressure. And as long as the center of pressure is inside the convex hull of the contact points, we know that there exist positive normal forces that can generate that center of pressure. Okay? And why don't we need to worry about the contact forces individually? Well, it's because here the, the center of mass acceleration, which is what we really want to generate, only depends on the center of pressure. It doesn't depend on the individual normal forces. So if I have two uh, different sets of normal forces that give me the same center of pressure, the center of mass acceleration is going to be the same. So I don't care to know exactly which contact forces I will generate as long as they give me the same center of mass acceleration which is basically the rate of change of my state here in this reduced model. The one who will need to care about the individual contact forces is going to be the reactive controller, TSID. Because that one is going to need to, to basically come up with motor commands. And this, of course, they depend on the individual contact forces. But here, we are only worrying about the center of mass behavior in this reduced model. So we don't care about the individual contact forces. We care, we care about the effect that the contact forces have on the center of mass. And that only depends on the center of pressure, according to this model. OK. So basically, we will be able to use this model as long as we have we are in a situation where these assumptions are satisfied. So this is going to be usable anytime we want to walk on a flat or almost flat ground. It's not going to generalize to the so-called multi-contact locomotion. So if you want to locomote also by using your, your hands, if you want to climb, for instance, if you want to use the, the handrail when you're uh, climbing stairs, this model is not going to work anymore, okay? So it's limited. But it's a one model that everybody implements on, on their legs robots and that works really well because it's a, it's a linear model, okay? And it's typically then for, for working on, on more complex scenarios, people, people have extended this model to adapt it to more complex situations. We are only going to use this model for the, for the class. <coughs> so we can just rearrange the equation uh, to get the, the center of mass acceleration expressed as a function of center of mass position and center of pressure. Uh, by the way, the reason why I call the center of pressure Z and not C for center of pressure, well, first of all, because C is already the center of mass, 
but the choice of z is because the center of pressure is also equal to the zero moment point which is the point on the ground where if you compute the the, the moments they are zero okay uh, i don't like to to refer to it using the zero moment point definition i prefer to call it center of pressure but i call it the because of because of that reason and in the code later you will sometimes find uh, zmp which stands for zero moment point it's just a synonym for center of pressure basically so just be aware of that so when we rearrange the, the linear inverted pendulum equation in this way we can see that basically the center of mass acceleration is going to be on a line uh, that is connecting the center of pressure with the center of mass so it's as if i had a, a force that is pushing the center of mass away from the center of pressure okay so let me draw it for you We can imagine that we have uh, the two feet of the robot. Okay. I have the center of mass here. So this is the center of mass. And I have my center of pressure here so this is that. then in this case the center of mass will accelerate in this direction right that is what that, that equation is telling me this center of mass acceleration is going to be in the direction connecting the center of pressure z with the center of mass position c when when z is going to be exactly on top of the center of mass the acceleration is going to be zero instead if z is not exactly on top of the center of mass then i'm going to have an acceleration that is pushing me away and the fact that this acceleration is pushing the center of mass away and not towards the center of pressure makes the system unstable. unstable exactly. Which is no surprise. Think of an inverted pendulum, it's, it's unstable. Even at the equilibrium, just a minimum perturbation is going to make it fall. So we have an unstable dynamical system, unfortunately, which is going to make our life a bit harder later. So we can now write down the dynamics in the standard uh, state space form. I defined omega as the square root of, the, of gravity divided by the height of the, of the center of mass. This is a standard way because omega is going to be the, the frequency of the inverted pendulum. It's just a constant, basically. And it simplifies a little bit the writing here. So I just rewrote the same equation but in standard state space form. So we have x dot equal ax plus du, where u is the center of pressure, x contains center of mass position and velocity. Of course, only in, in the plane xy because that is constant, so it's not part of the state. So this is for continuous time, but when we do trajectory optimization, uh, it's much easier if we have a, a discrete uh, dynamical system. It's also, I think, more, it's somehow closer to reality because in reality, your, uh, your controller is, is not gonna be working in continuous time, okay? You're gonna have a, a discrete time controller because it's, it's implemented with a computer, hopefully not with an, electronic board. <laughs>
so we discretize the system um, this is basically uh, the discretized version of this if you're not familiar with the discretization process you may wonder how the hell did we get hyperbolic cosines and sines uh, from this very simple dynamical system the, the reason is that you need to take the metric exponential of this matrix when you take the metric exponential you get of course exponentials inside and uh, hyperbolic sines and cosines are defined as uh, sums and differences of, of exponentials so that's how you get them but I mean we don't need to worry about this this is standard uh, control theory math there is nothing fancy or, or related to locomotion and, and robotics here so this is our discrete time dynamics of the reduced model which is a linear inverted pendulum model or LIPM for short yeah and we also discretize with, with other methods I mean, <coughs> like uh, um, trapezoidal approximation of the integral or so this is an exact uh, discretization there is yeah, no approximation but there is the approximation of the fact that you are the controlling uh, in the whole, uh, the, the, uh, the assumption is that the, the center of pressure remains constant yeah, during for, the, for, one, during for the duration the of the time step. Yeah. So there is an approximation. Yeah, but this is the exact integration. This is the exact integration, assuming a, a zero order hold. Yeah, it's just if, once, one, uh, if one wants to avoid the uh, uh, If you want to have. Cosine and sine to simplify. If you want to have um, a center of pressure that varies during the the time step, you need somehow to parameterize it. You can parameterize it, for instance, with polynomials, and then you can recompute this. But this first matrix is going to be the same. The only one that's going to change is B, the B matrix but the A matrix is going to be the same one because it is simply the metric exponential of, of this matrix and it's independent of how you, you parameterize your control inputs so now that we have our reduced model which is linear and it is low dimensional and it's also in discrete time then trajectory optimization is a walk in the park and let, we're going to see how we do it. So the idea is that uh, the, the, the contacts, they are already predefined. So it's your job as a, as a user to basically decide uh, where you, you want to make uh, contact with the ground. So to, you have to decide the footsteps in case of uh, a humanoid walking on a flat ground. So the footsteps are going to be defined basically by um, a center of pressure trajectory. Why the center of pressure and the footsteps are the same thing? So in, with a humanoid, we can imagine that typically you have uh, a foot with a, with a finite uh, size. You don't have a point foot. You have a foot, a foot that is something like a, a, a rectangle, as I drew, as I drew there. But if I, if I ask you where would you like your robot to have the center of pressure in that foot, where would you put it? In the middle. Yeah, exactly, in the middle. Why would you put it in the middle? The most stable position. Yeah, exactly. It's the most stable position because if you, if you move your, your center of pressure to, to, to the border of the foot, then what could happen is that the foot could tip over and this is typically what happens before falling so in theory actually this is not true because we are very well capable of, of walking while making our foot tipping over right i can do it without any problem everybody can do it i'm not very deep uh, but that's not something you would like your robot to do because it's it's much more difficult to to walk by doing that so the most stable 
behavior, even if it's not stable in a theoretical sense, but it's only in an intuitive sense, is to keep the center of pressure in the middle of the foot so that you're sure that your foot are not tipping over and this makes you feel more comfortable and in practice it works better okay so once we have defined the the footsteps then basically by defining the footsteps we automatically define where we would like the center of pressure to, to be this doesn't mean that it's gonna be exactly there but this is our desire okay <clears throat> so this gonna give you give us basically the reference center of pressure we will call um, with P the the footsteps which are again the reference center of pressure with uh, C ref and C dot ref we have the, the reference center of mass uh, position trajectory and velocity trajectory so of course these are not again the real center of mass trajectory that we are going to get and execute on the robot these are just some some references so they don't need to be to be accurate or especially they don't, they don't need to be consistent with the dynamics for instance i could specify as a reference center of mass trajectory just a straight line going from the initial uh, position to the final position and that's with a constant velocity so velocity being constant connecting this uh, initial point with the final point of course this is not feasible i cannot walk with a straight center of mass trajectory because when i walk i need to swing my center of mass left and right to follow basically my footsteps you can try to walk with a straight center. I mean, you can walk with a straight center of mass trajectory when you're running, basically. Because in that case, you can almost go straight. But the slower you move, and typically robots move quite slowly, the more you need to swing. I mean, if, if ideally, I mean, in the extreme case, if you walk in a quasi-static uh, way, you really need to move your center of mass on top of your uh, supporting foot every time because otherwise you fall in the opposite direction. So the straight line reference would be only just uh, an approximate trajectory. Then the real trajectory that is compatible with the dynamics and that you can really execute on the system, well, that's the job of the trajectory optimizer to, to compute. So we have this uh, basically reference trajectory for center of mass, position, velocity, and center of pressure. And then we have this uh, trajectory optimization problem, where the variables are the center of mass, position, velocity, and the center of pressure. So let's start from the cost function. What do we optimize? Well, we want to minimize basically the, the tracking error for the center of mass position, center of mass velocity, and especially for the center of pressure. We want the center of pressure, U, to be very close to the footsteps center. Because P represents this, the center of the footstep. Okay, so at each time step, we would like these two to be as close as possible these two to be closed, these two to be closed, and how much we care about each of these three objectives depends on the weights that we set, alpha, beta, and gamma. So it's your, again, it's your job as a user to tune this weight properly so that you get a nice behavior. Because of course, if, if you set this one too high, then the only thing that the system cares about is to keep the center of pressure at the center of the foot which means it doesn't care about where the center of mass is going so the center of mass could be diverging and he wouldn't care less because it would just put the center of pressure to the center of the foot and the cost function would be basically zero at the same time if you set this one too high so tracking the, the reference center of mass velocity, the robot is just going to care about tracking this velocity. So it's going to be stable, but then 
the center of pressure may be far away from the center of the foot, which is not robust in practice. So this is going to give you a nice center of mass trajectory, but that is going to be very difficult to execute on the real system because the center of pressure may be getting to the boundaries of, the, of your foot all the time. So you need to find uh, the right uh, trade-off between alpha and, and gamma. Beta typically is not used. So typically, and um, in the software, which you're going to run, beta is going to be zero. So actually, this term is not going to be zero. We just we will just have velocity and center of pressure. That's sufficient. Yeah. You're, you're assuming that there is no double support phase, right? right? Because you're asking for being the yeah. foot. Yeah, that's a very good point I forgot to mention, thanks. Uh, I'm assuming that when I'm walking, I am switching directly from my right foot to my left foot. So, in theory, I could have a, a, a very short moment in which I am in contact with both feet. Mm -hmm. But that moment should be smaller than the duration of the time step. So that if I look at what happens to my system only at the discrete time steps, I, I always see it on, on one foot, not, never on, on two feet. That's a typical way it is, it is done. Mm -hmm. But for, uh, for bipedal locomotion, this assumption is very reasonable because when you're walking, the, the amount of time you're in contact with both feet is very, very short. It's typically less than 0 0.1 seconds. Okay. So this is the cost function. Let's take a look now at the constraints. First constraint, my center of pressure should be not further away from the footstep than from the center of the footstep than the size of the foot divided by two. So basically this constraint is telling me that my center of pressure should be inside the, the, the foot, the footstep. Okay, because of course it cannot go outside. And this is what guarantees <laughs> that there are positive normal forces that generate the center of pressure. Okay, so this is basically the, is the unilateral contact constraint translated in, into the center of pressure position constraint. You, you don't have this, uh, this constraint explain explicitly the, the fact that the PSP has to be positive, no? The fact that? The, the P has to be all positive, no? So P are the well, the well, footsteps. Ah, okay. The position of the foot. Ah, okay. The position, the, the the central position of the foot. Okay. And here I'm saying that my my center of pressure should be inside oh. the the foot. And inside the foot, it means less than the center plus half the size the size of the foot in in each direction x and y. So here. Just to simplify things a little bit, I'm assuming that my foot are aligned mm -hmm. with with the x and y axis, so I'm walking straight, basically in, in the x direction and y is the lateral direction. I could also rotate them or walk in a, in another direction. They just wouldn't be written in this way. You would have some coupling between x and y, but okay. it's a minor modification. So, uh, center of pressure constraints, and then the other constraint I have, which is an equality constraint, is the dynamics of my system. So this is where I have my hyperbolic sines and cosines, which is uh, the linear inverted pendulum dynamics, which basically says that my state and my control inputs should, should be related by the dynamics of the system. Okay, if I don't if I don't have that, then I basically I have no relationship between X and U. So the, the solver could just choose any control input and any trajectory. So you could directly satisfy the 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 cost function with a zero value. So it wouldn't make any sense. 
and then typically you specify the initial states because it's the initial state of your robot so it's something that you know and often you also specify the final state which is where you want to get at the end of the of the walking motion so typically you want to get basically on top of your final footsteps with a zero velocity so that you know that you're uh, you're stable you're in static equilibrium Any question about that? Uh, yeah. Basically, with this control strategy, we are saying that if we stop the robot at any time with one foot or off, so mm -hmm. he will remain in that position that is a stable position for him? No. So yeah. that would be basically to generate a, a quasi static <coughs> walking, yes. which is not something that you want to see typically but since the center of pressure is let's say more or less in the middle of the foot okay okay, okay yes we have the velocity of the center of pressure. which are so many yet yeah. that's a first point and the second point is that even if your center of mass velocity was zero here there is nothing saying that the center of mass should be on top of your of your foot oh, of your supporting the foot so the center of mass could be well in front okay. it's, it's typically in front yes. of your supporting foot so even if you reach that position with a zero velocity you will be unstable you, you are unstable because if here i i do this i, I fall Okay. I completely confuse the center of mm -hmm. no but this is a very common mistake actually and it's a good point so we we are often talking about stability related to two different concepts one is the contact stability contact stability is basically the concept of not breaking the contact so you don't want uh, the foot to slip or to tip over in this way or to also slip in the angular direction that's contact stability and that's related to my center of pressure remaining inside the the, the foot okay then there is the center of mass stability or equilibrium in case you just want to stay static and and that's that's different so contact stability is something that you want at all the time so we have this constraint because you never want to break the contact at a unexpected time you just want to break them when it's it's predefined that they, they should break instead for the center of mass uh, stability or better equilibrium you just want it at the end so typically the, the final constraint is telling me that i want my center of mass to be on top of my footstep with zero velocity that gives me equilibrium at the end of the horizon but throughout the trajectory i'm not in, in static equilibrium i'm constantly moving and if you and if you stopped the robot in the middle typically i mean 99 percent of the time it would be in an unstable yeah. uh, status where it, it couldn't uh, stabilize okay and the second question is with this control strategy can we make the robot run i mean is it different to walk or run maybe because running depends on the always a contact point so i think that for the contact it's not a problem because basically you, you would just need to introduce a flight phase between uh, right and left foot mm -hmm. and in the flight phase you you have no control because you're you're flying so you, you don't have contact forces so that would be like a ballistic motion you have to predict uh, where to put where the foot could land you have to know in advance where the foot yeah. is going to land and how so can yeah can but that wouldn't be a problem maybe what is a bit more uh, brittle in this case is the assumption that the center of mass height would be constant because when you're yeah. when you're flying you have gravity uh -huh. so uh, the, the center of mass acceleration is not going to be zero in that phase mm -hmm. so you but again that you could work it out I think what, what's really, really 
difficult and the reason why people don't use this for running is that we cannot make uh, most robots run okay. in practice so it's more like mechanical or uh, let's say low level control reasons but I think that this methodology could be easily extended for, uh, for running at least, at least in simulation we could make it run mm -hmm. you could do it as, as the exam for the class for instance <laughs> It would take you a couple of months only. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, trajectory optimization problem, well, let's go back to it. Can you guess which, which kind of optimization problem this is? So what, what, let's start from the cost function. What, what kind of function is that? Is it, Quadratic, yeah, because you just you just have the squares of your control variables. What about the constraints? Come on, you should shout it. <laughs> They're linear, yeah. Everything is linear because all the all the variables they are u. U here is appearing linearly. It's linear x is basically c and c dot it's a variable so this is linear and this is linear as well so everything is linear in the constraints everything is quadratic uh, in the cost so quadratic cost linear constraints this is a we have seen only one kind of optimization problem so that's the one i'm asking for it's a QP, it's a quadratic program. Actually, it's a least squares program, which is a special kind of QP that we also solved for, uh, for doing TSID. It's the same kind of, of problem. What is the specificity of the least squares pro program? Least squares, you need to add the cost function, which is the two norm of, a, of an affine which is a specific kind of convex quadratic because the gradient is in the range space of the of the hessian which is not necessarily the case for a convex quadratic it's a very subtle difference yeah you cannot imagine a quadratic without a normal um so since you asked for it i'm gonna show it that they're not exactly the same <laughs> I thought this was boring, that's why I was I was sparing it to you, but you asked for it. So the quadratic is typically one half x transpose qx plus um, say g transpose x, where q must be uh, positive semi definite. That's this is convex quadratic. <coughs> so QP typically solves this uh, the problem with these kind of cost functions. Least squares instead the cost function is AX minus P or plus B whatever square is typically one half in front. And if you develop this, you get one half x transpose a transpose a x minus two b transpose a x, and then you have the useless b transpose b, which doesn't really matter when you're doing minimization because it doesn't depend on the variable. So this is these squares. So with A transpose A, this is basically your, your Q. By, by construction, since every matrix defined as the, the product of a matrix times its transpose, it's going to be symmetric and positive semi-definite. OK, so for, for this part, they are totally equivalent. For any Q, I can find A that gives me that Q. And for uh, any A, I can find uh, a Q matrix that such that A transpose A is equal to that Q matrix. That part is the same. What is a bit, what is different is this part here. No. 
this is basically the, the G vector. Actually, this is the G transpose vector, which means that G is equal to A transpose B. So can G be anything? No. It can only, you can, with, with a least square, because function G must be in the range space of A transpose. Because G is, is basically a linear combination of the columns of A transpose. Okay, so you, you have some constraint uh, between G and Q because this is also basically the range space of Q. So G must be in the range space of Q because Q is A transpose A, so the range space of Q is the same of A transpose. Okay, which means that there are some complex quadratic that you cannot express as these squares. So these squares is a subclass of convex quadratic. Okay, when G of when G transpose is in some way in the known space of Q. That's it's in the range yeah. space of Q. Yeah. Now does this matter? No. Because in practice we use QP solver, so the solver doesn't even know that we have this property. If we were using a least square solver that somehow exploit this property, then it would matter, but I'm not aware of any solver who does that. Mm -hmm. So this is only theoretical talking. That's why I didn't want to do it, but you push me to do it. <laughs> okay, so we have a least squares uh, program to solve for doing our trajectory optimization problem where the variables are basically the state and the control so when you're doing trajectory optimization using state and control as variable uh, that is typically called collocation I don't know if you ever heard of this term that's one option for doing so like your optimization, you have both state and control as variables. Okay. The other option for doing intellectual optimization is called shooting. Okay. In this case, you remove the state from your uh, problem variables. You have only the control inputs as variables, and you express the state as a function of the control inputs because. Of course, once you know the initial state and you know the control inputs, just by integrating, si simulating your system dynamics, you can recompute the state. Okay, and since in this case the dynamics of the system is linear, well, the state trajectory is a is an affine function of the of the control and the initial state, which is typically fixed, so it's it's known. And that's what we, we do in the software that we're going to use. We don't, uh, we don't implement the problem in this version, but we implement it in this version here, where the only variable is, is the center of pressure. We no longer have the dynamics as a constraint because we don't have the state. So whatever value of x of u we choose, we compute the corresponding x trajectory, which satisfies the dynamics by definition because it's computed by applying u to the dynamics. And then c and c dot inside the cost function, they are basically recomputed by, by using the, the dynamics applied recursively to the initial state with the given control trajectory. So do you know more or less what you have inside these matrices that give you the, the, the center of mass trajectory given the initial state and the control inputs? This is something that you typically see in a, in a control theory class when you, when you talk about controllability. You have this controllability matrix where you have uh, B, A, B, a squared B, A 
to the power of 3b up to a to the n minus 1b. That's, that's the controllability matrix. Well, inside these matrices here, you have basically the same things. You just need to write down the dynamics and write explicitly unroll it, let's say. We, we could maybe quickly do it. The whiteboard just to give you better intuition. So if you have x1 equal a x0 plus b is 0, then we have x2, which is a x1 plus b u1, and we can replace x1 with the, this expression. So we get a square x0 plus a b u0 plus b u1. And then if you keep iterating this, you get that x at time step k is equal to a to the power of k x0 plus the summation for i going from k minus 1 to 0 of a to the power of i b u i. Okay. And this you can write it in matrix form well, the first term is just a k x zero and this you can write as a as a matrix vector uh, multiplication we have here b we have a b up to a to the k minus one b times the vector of control input u0, u1, up to u k minus 1. And I think it's b of k. So uh, yeah. b multiplies, yeah, it's the opposite. <laughs> okay, you're so annoying. k minus 1, b, up to a, b, and b. Okay, that's the right one. And you can do it basically for all the time steps, and, and you get these matrices. So P, PPS would be the one that multiplies the initial state x0, and PPU would be this one. So on the line above, you would have here B, here 0, here A, B, and here you would have A to the K minus 2, B. So it could be a lower triangular, a block lower triangular matrix that you get for the, for the one multiplying U. The one multiplying the initial state, instead you just have the uh, successive powers of the A matrix. So do you foresee any potential problem with that? Remember that our system is unstable. Uh, I think it is controllable. But I mean, once you have inequality constraints, talking about controllability doesn't really make much sense. Um, no, I was more thinking in terms of numerical issues. This is the, the sequence of back control is too long, probably. Maybe. The matrix in there. Yes, the values of the matrix to the power of mm, k minus one yeah. become zero, and, and or or b. values more against the So, an unstable system in discrete time it means that the eigenvalues are for an unstable system. That's continuous time, 
but here we have a discrete time system. Greater than one. Yeah, the, the magnitude of the eigenvalues is greater than one. So when you take the power of something that is greater than one, what, what does it do? It grows. So we can imagine that if our uh, horizon is, is too long, then we're going to get very high numbers inside these matrices. Very high and at the same time very small because we have both a to the power of n and a. So a to the power of n grows but a remains constant. So we have both very high and very small numbers inside these matrices, which means that the condition number of these matrices is, is really bad. So we're going to get into trouble for, for long uh, time horizons. What about instead if we did things this way, so with collocation, by keeping both state and control inside the, inside the problem variables? Would it be better or the same or worse? <laughs> you have more variables because, of course, you have also the state. Typically, the state is twice as big as the, as the control for these systems because they are second order. So you multiply times three the number of variables, which means that since the complexity of optimization problems typically scales with the cube of the size, a multiplication times three is actually a multiplication times 27 in terms of computation time. So with this approach, it would take probably around 27 times longer to solve, but in terms of numerical conditioning, this is much better. Yeah, because we have the Gatsy formulation of the constraints. So yeah, because in, in the constraints, yeah. we, we only have A and B. We don't have A to the power of the, the horizon. So we don't have very large number building up inside our matrices. Okay, so this is slower, but it's numerically more stable. The other one, which is the one you have implemented in the virtual machine, this is faster, but it's numerically less stable. So especially you won't be able to optimize for long horizons with this method. It breaks down after a few seconds of preview horizon. Because we have an unstable system. If the system was stable, no problem, because as you compute the, the sec, uh, power of a matrix with eigenvalues that are less than one, they get smaller and smaller and smaller, so that's not a problem. The result is the same, I mean, we have only reformulated the problem. Yeah, the result is the same the problem in, in, th in theory, the up to numerical precision, let's say. <laughs> So we could use this for sure, and then uh, in the meanwhile use the other for the, for the long horizons. horizons yeah, could be mm -hmm. having two processors. I don't know what Yeah, if you want to optimize for a very long horizon, you need to use the other method, which is not implemented in the in the software I give you. Actually, I think that uh, the students that implemented that started by implementing the first method and then for some reason decided to switch to this one and only later realized that there was this problem. But since he's using it for short horizons, it's not really a problem for him because he does MPC. So with MPC, typically the horizon is short. Here in studying class, we're going to do trajectory optimization. So we may want to use a long horizon and we cannot do it with this formulation. So since it's 11.30, I think it's a good time to take a break before we start the next subject. So see you in 10 minutes.